All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very boring slide. I'm sorry. Um, but we're going to talk about some abstract art, and I promise it will get much more interesting than this. Uh, to start out, abstract just means that the subject of the artwork is the making of the artwork, not an object you're trying to represent. So abstract art is not about the actual object itself. It's about how you can use the art to create a sense of it or the essence of it or the emotion of making it or the process or the inspiration of it. So it's not like I'm going to draw a duck. It's I'm going to draw what a duck makes me feel. I'm going to draw the experience of seeing a duck. I'm going to draw the way that the paint makes a duck. That's the point of abstract art. So it's kind of confusing until you see some examples. So let's start with the examples. Some artists come at this as a progression. So they start out, this is Piet Mondrian. Uh, he's French, which is why I mispronounced his name right there. Uh, he started with his real, fairly realistic drawings of trees. You can see like that it looks like tree, that it's a tree. Um, obviously he took liberties with the color and some of the details, but it looks like a tree. And then he progressed over here to this gray tree where you can sort of see it still is kind of tree-like, but if I hadn't told you tree, you might not have necessarily gotten it. But it has kind of the essence, this idea of these overlapping branches. But now it's become more about the lines and the intersection of lines. So it's more about how the art element of line is working to create a tree. And then you get over here where it's even less about the tree, less about and more about how the lines interact and how you make the artwork and how these elements interact with each other. Until finally you get the style that Piet Mondrian is, I, whew, I really promise I can say his name, just apparently not today. Uh, this is the style here that he's most famous for were his grids. And he normally used the primary colors of red, gr red, blue, and yellow in order to create his composition. So really breaking it down to the very basic foundation of how do you make art and making the making of art and the elements of art the subject of his work. We can also look at the progression of Vasily Kandinsky. Um, and yeah, I said his name right. Um, I know it's a W. It, that's, that's how it's said. Um, so he, again, he started with fairly realistic. It's simplified, but it's fairly realistic. You know, like, this is a building, that's a building, that's a brick wall, here's some snow, there's a bush. I can see those things. Um, and you can see how he starts losing some of the details to get at the basics, the essence of what they are. So instead of it being about the actual object being recognizable and understandable, it becomes about the interpretation and the way the elements act in that space. And again, eventually he comes down here to his um, final composition here. And this um, is sort of his interaction with the moment. This is what this makes him feel and see and think uh, Kandinsky was really inspired by music, so a lot of these, he actually calls them compositions, um, like a musical composition. He's composing his uh, canvas based off of these different things that he's hearing in the music. Uh, so we are going to go over here, uh, and we are going to pause my video right now. If you are at home, if I am in class, I'm going to pause my video. And then we're going to watch these two little things. They're two little animations of some Kandinsky work. I also just realized I spelled Kandinsky wrong on this slide. Whoops. Uh, but anyways, after you're done with that, come back and we'll unpause this and continue watching. Okay, hopefully you're back because we just moved on. Uh, now we're going to talk about how do you make abstraction. Uh, you can do things like tracing the shadows, looking at the negative spaces of where things are. Um, you can talk about using color in a more expressive way. So like this here is a tree line. There's some land. This looks like some water out here. Water's not normally orange, at least not naturally. But when you choose to use colors that make an emotion, have like a response to the viewer, maybe the water is orange this time. Maybe that warm, soft feeling is what you want the viewer to see. You can also break things up into pixels, zoom in and turn them into a grid. 
Um, Chuck Close does this a lot. Uh, it's a really great way of kind of chunking up your drawing so you're focusing in on each little piece of it rather than the whole big thing overall. And you get to focus in on the essence of the piece. Um, and the last way is you can look at it through the lens of cubism, which was an art mo movement that was exploring an object, but not as just seen in one dimension. It was an object as seen through time, as seen in different places and different positions, but existing in all of those positions at one time, which is why you get those weird chopped up ladies whose faces are going the wrong direction. Uh, so yeah. We can look at some work by Susan Briggs. Uh, she does some of that shadow tracing to make some of those abstract things. Um, the idea of getting just the outline, not looking for the fine, fine details. Um, you can see she does a lot of nature-based work here. Some of it gets more abstract than others here. You might be able to tell what it is, but it gets a little bit more confusing. Okay, so I mentioned Chuck Close before. This is his self-portrait from 2000. He works with a grid that breaks up his face in these tiny, itty bitty squares. Um, and then he adds different colors. And together, those individual cells blend together like tiny pixels in a photo to make an image that is more recognizable. Um, the reason he does this is he actually has a disorder that makes it impossible for him to remember faces. It's actually called face blindness. Um, so he will recognize someone by knowing what their hair looks like, knowing what kind of clothes they wear, recognizing their voice, but he can't look at your face and know who you are. Um, it's even his own face. He'll look in the mirror and not know who that person is, even though he's looked in the mirror every day and it's him. Um, so it is actually a, a medical condition and he uses his art to help him overcome that. Um, by focusing really in on the details of his face, it helps him map what his face looks like and what the face of his friends and colleagues look like. And that's why he tends to paint a lot of his own family and friends. Other artists also use the grid in order to focus on just bits and pieces to create new associations by putting things next to each other. And really just to kind of focus in on the different colors and values and lines and the other elements of art as opposed to just purely in on a subject matter. Uh, here's another one. Uh, again, here, like, you don't even have to have a subject. You can just have stripes and dots and dashes and pixels. Uh, you can use repetition to create a new image. You know, this one, all of these make sense, and then, whoop, the sky went upside down. What just happened? Um, so you can create interest and focal points using a helpful grid because it creates a sense of stability and then you can throw something in there that helps challenge what the viewer is thinking. When it comes to expressive color, um, this one's pretty easy. You just use the colors that you feel instead of the colors that you see. Um, this is Franz Marc. Uh, Matisse is also really known for this. Here you have a couple other ones. Again, this is a very impressionist kind of a feel. We get into our cubism. Like I said, the ladies whose faces go in crazy directions. This is cubism. This one over here is Picasso, and I'm forgetting which one this is. It might be a Picasso too, but don't quote me on that. Um, we can look at some more on this one. We've got another one. Don't they look lovely? Um, you can do cubism with more than just people's faces. It can be with buildings and places. You can combine different aspects of things. You can do shadows plus cubism plus expressive color. Um, and all of these things create a sense of abstraction where you almost think you can identify what's happening, but there's just a little something that's not just a natural representation of the world. Um, so again, we have some more abstract they can be rough abstract they can be geometric -y abstract there's a lot of different choices for abstract and we're going to use this idea of abstract in our next project